Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Mirth, where we do a fair and objective analysis of the church and its truth claims, its history, doctrine and policy. So we're continuing with this multi-episode series looking at Joseph Smith's polygamy. If you didn't watch part four, we had a look at some of the accounts of Joseph Smith telling close associates about an angel appearing to him three times, commanding him to practice polygamy, and that the angel commanded him to, uh, or threatened, to kill him with a drawn sword if he did not do the practice. We had a look at some of the accounts and the quotes. We had a look at some faithful perspectives and also uh, some responses that critics would give to push back. Uh, part five, we're going to be looking at his marriages to women who had living legal husbands or polyandry. This is going to be kind of a longer video. There's a lot of things I'm going to go through. I want to be quite comprehensive. Uh, so let's get stuck in. I'm going to start with a quote. This comes from, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, this is Marlon K. Jensen. So he was a uh, former church historian. So this was the Swedish uh, rescue fireside. So a lot of people in Sweden uh, experienced a faith crisis. And I believe Marlon uh, Jensen went out to do a fireside and reach out to these people. And he said, uh, so the question of polyandry, polygamy is when a man has multiple wives. Polyandry is when a man marries another man's wife. Joseph did both. So he's acknowledging that that is what happened. So what we're going to cover throughout this video are the polyandrous wives of Joseph Smith. I believe there is around 14. We're going to be specifically looking in detail at the three which are given sort of like the most controversy surrounding Zaina Huntington, Sylvia Sessions, and Miranda Johnson Hyde. And then we're going to be having a look were these polygamous marriages or polyandrous marriages, were they sexual? Uh, were they time and eternity ceilings? And does this then violate DNC 132? Was Joseph Smith committing adultery? So we're going to be having uh, a look at the evidence. So this is the Gospel Topics essay, is what it has to say about uh, polyandry. And I have a graphic on the screen that I got this from josephsmithpolygamy.org of the list of wives and their legal husband. Uh, so take a have a look at that on the screen. Uh, so this is from the LS Gospel Topics essay. So following his marriage to Louisa Beeman and before he married other single women, Joseph Smith was sealed to a number of women who were already married. Neither these women nor Joseph explained much about these sealings, though several women said they were for eternity alone. Other women left no records, making it unknown whether their sealings were for time and eternity or were for eternity alone. So yes, yeah, some, some of the marriages, uh, the women stated that it was a ceiling. They continued to live uh, with their husbands. Some of the husbands weren't members of the church, and it's very likely that there was really no relationship or any, any intimate relationship. Uh, but with some, um, as we look through the evidence, it's a bit unclear. Uh, this comes from josephsmithpolygamy.org. So this would have been Brian Heels. He says, few things are more confusing than Joseph Smith's ceilings to legally married women. Due to limitations in the number and types of documents available, understanding what transpired is difficult and complex. Joseph Smith taught that a genuine plurality of husbands called polyandry was adultery. So we're going to have a look at that scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants. There is no indication he was hypocritical in this regard. His ceilings to women with civil husbands appear to have been for eternity only meaning that they would only take effect after death. They did not constitute marriages for this life. Some of the women's legal husbands were not active Latter-day Saints, so ceilings to them were not possible. In such cases, marrying Joseph or another devout believer for the next life is understandable. Yet some of the ceilings were to women with believing spouses, which are more puzzling. Uh, so they're acknowledging that some of these women uh, had non-member husbands, so they couldn't be sealed to their husbands. So it was in turn the alone uh, sealings. But some of these husbands were actually members of the church, which is definitely uh, troubling and puzzling, even if um, there was no sexual relations uh, being sealed uh, to someone else's wife in the next life. I know I wouldn't be happy if uh, the prophet did that with my wife. That would uh, definitely uh, baffle me. So fair Latter-day Saints, they say, 
uh, that Joseph's ceiling to their wives doesn't appear to have changed anything in their daily lives or their relationship to their current husbands. The relationship between these women and their husbands appear to have not changed even after they, after they were sealed to Joseph Smith. Of the eight well-documented cases, five of the husbands were Latter-day Saints and the other three were either not active or not associ associated with the church. In all cases, these women continue to live with their husbands, most of them doing so until their husbands died. So that's an important detail. They continued to live with their husbands. They didn't move in and live with Joseph Smith. These eternal marriages appear to have had little effect upon the lives of the women involved, with the exception that they would be sealed to Joseph in the afterlife rather than to their earthly husbands. So let's have a look at Zining Zina Huntington. So in 1840, Zina met Henry Jacobs and agreed to marry him. Uh, this comes from Zina's biographer. She says, while Zina and her brothers were living with the prophet and Emma, she met and became engaged to Henry Bailey Jacobs. They asked the prophet to perform their marriage ceremony, which was to be held at the county clerk's office. Uh, this was March 7th, 1841. When the couple arrived, the prophet was not there. After a wait, they decided to ask the clerk, John C. Bennett, if he would perform the marriage, which he did. When the couple later met the prophet, Zina asked him why he hadn't come, as he had promised. He told her he had, it had been made known to him that she was to be his celestial wife, and he cannot give to another one who had been given to him. Uh, again, so during Henry and Zina's marriage, Joseph sent Henry on eight missions, and at one point, Joseph sent a message to Zina through her brother, which said, tell Zina, I have put it off and put it off until an angel with a drawn sword has stood before me and told me if I did not establish that principle and live it, I would lose my position and my life and the church progress no further. So we looked at that quote uh, in the last video. Uh, so after four proposals and being pressured with the responsibility for the life of the prophet, Zina finally accepted. After Joseph's death, Brigham Young also took Zina for his wife, while she was still married to Henry Jacobs. Brigham called Henry to serve a mission in England and told him to find another wife. While Henry was in England, Zina began living at the young house with her children and soon bore a child with Brigham. Uh, so uh, we don't know if her marriage to, to Joseph Smith was um, time and eternity or just in eternal sealing, um, but it does seem that he said that Zina was to be uh, his plural or celestial wife, that the angel ha had threatened and commanded him, and that uh, she did then marry him. Uh, but it's, it's strange that he would ask a woman who already had a living husband uh, when he was commanded to, to practice polygamy. Uh, some apologists have thought of it, well, maybe Joseph Smith is doing this as a way to sort of fulfill the command to practice polygamy, being sealed to these women but not actually having to have a, an intimate relationship with them to spare the feelings of his wife uh, but I, I do find it quite troubling that Henry was uh, told to go on a mission and then Brigham Young uh, married her apparently for time and eternity and it seems like he stole his wife and then had a child with her so we're gonna find out a little bit more so when I heard that God had revealed the law of celestial marriage, that we would have the privilege of associating in a family relationship in the worlds to come, I searched the scripture and by humble prayer to my heavenly father, I obtained a testimony for myself that God had required that order to be established in his church. I made a great sacrifice than to give my life for I never anticipated again to be looked upon as an honorable woman by those I dearly loved. How could I compromise conscience and lay aside the sure testimony of the Spirit of God for the glory of this world? So Zion is uh, claiming that after the proposals to become Joseph Smith's plural uh, wife, that she did inquire and receive a testimony for herself. One might say that she was, you know, she was pressured, she was coerced, uh, and, uh, you know, she was being asked by the prophet of God. So, of course, she would receive that testimony, but that is her experience, and she she believes that uh, she received a manifestation that polygamy was of God. Uh, so this is an interview with the RLDS church. Zina herself clearly explains that the basis for her choice. So when I heard that God had revealed the law of celestial marriage, that we would have the privilege of associating in family relationships in the worlds to come. I searched the scriptures and by humble prayer to my heavenly father, obtained a testimony for myself that God had required that order to be established in his church. Uh, 
So after being faced with uh, more questions that were maybe a bit more personal and intrusive, she finally terminated the interview by saying, Mr. White, you're speaking on the most sacred experiences of my life. So she deems uh, this, uh, this experience, uh, this ceiling to Joseph as a very personal experience. So after Joseph's death, Brigham Young also took Zina for his wife while she was still married to Henry Jacobs. Brigham called Henry to serve a mission in England and told him to find another wife. Uh, so this is a letter uh, from Henry to, uh, to Zina. And he wrote, Zina, my mind never will change from worlds without ends. No, never. The same affection is there and never can be moved. I do not murmur nor complain of the handlings of God. No, verily, no, but I feel alone and no one to speak to. To call my own, I feel like a lamb without a mother. I do not blame any person or persons. No, may the Lord our Father bless Brother Brigham and all pertains unto him forever. Tell him for me, I have no feelings against him, nor ever had. All is right according to the law of the celestial kingdom of our God, Joseph Smith. Um, I find this quote actually very, very sad. Um, I, I believe that they were going through maybe some marriage troubles uh, at this time. Uh, but the fact that she then uh, ended the marriage with, with Henry and uh, got with Brigham, uh, it's, it's, it's very sad. And it's uh, very hard to, to really reconcile or, or, or justify that, how that can be right. So this is a critical response to polyandry and this comes from the CS letter so in DNC 132 it very clearly states that the only purpose of polygamy is to multiply and replenish the earth and to bear the souls of men or at least that's one of the main reasons why did Joseph marry women who were already married these women were obviously not virgins which violates DNC 132 verse 61 which I'll read if any man espouse a virgin and desires espouse another and the first give her consent and if he espouse the second and they are virgins and have vowed to no other man, then is he justified? He cannot commit adultery for they are given unto him. For he cannot commit adultery with them that belongeth unto him and to no one else. Uh, so Zaina Huntington, she'd been married seven and a half months and was about six months pregnant with her first husband's baby at the time she married Joseph. Clearly, she didn't need any more help to bear the souls of men. So that's uh, quite a funny remark there. But uh, yeah, it, it says that um, that polygamy is to be practiced if they with women who are virgins who aren't vowed to any other man. So of course, women who are married uh, wouldn't meet that criteria. They wouldn't be virgins, and they have obviously made vows uh, to their husband. Uh, so therefore, uh, that it would be adultery to to marry other men's wives. So it's very hard to make sense of this if there were time and eternity relationships and again if the if the main purpose for polygamy is to have children is to raise a righteous seed to bear the souls of men why would joseph be sealing uh, himself to these women just for eternity if, if the purpose is to have children which therefore means sexual relations for already seen so in 1915 uh sylvia session so this is one of the other wives of joseph smith uh, her daughter, Josephine, signed a statement that in 1882, Sylvia told me that I was the daughter of the prophet Joseph Smith. In 1915, Sylvia Session, Lyon's daughter, signed a statement that in 1882, Sylvia told me that I was the daughter of the prophet Joseph Smith. She having been sealed to the prophet at the time that her husband, Mr. Lyon, was out of fellowship with the church. It is not known whether Sylvia was referring to your daughter as being a literal descendant of Joseph Smith or if she was referring to the fact that she had been sealed to the prophet. In any case, in 2016, the daughter was shown by DNA testing to be definitely not the biological daughter of Joseph Smith. Now, this one uh, is very controversial because uh, Sylvia seems to be saying to your daughter, Josephine, that she is the daughter of Joseph Smith. I read that and I say that most likely the biological daughter, which would imply that there would have been sexual relations. Now, uh, DNA has proven that she is not the daughter of Joseph Smith, but the daughter of Windsor Lyon. Uh, now, I apologize before that DNA result came out. Uh, some of them believe that Joseph Smith was the father, according to this evidence. But because uh, Windsor had been disfellowshipped from the church, although it wasn't a divorce, she was no longer with him and then was with joseph smith and they had a time and eternity marriage which is quite quite troubling considering that she was still legally married 
uh, to Mr. Lyon, but but now the, um, apologies would tend to uh, take the position that, oh no, she didn't have sexual relations with Joseph Smith, because that would have been polyandry or adultery. And this quote is just very ambiguous, or maybe it means that she's the daughter because she sealed to Joseph. Uh, but the other implication a critic might take is, well, did Sylvia have sex with Joseph and Windsor around the same time? And she just thought Joseph Smith was the father. Um, why else would she say that uh, her daughter is the daughter of Joseph Smith? So this comes from Joseph Smith's polygamy.org. In the past few decades, researchers have scrutinized Sylvia's relationship with Joseph Smith, perhaps more than any of his plural marriages. Many review the limited available evidences and assume that her daughter, Josephine Lyon, was fathered by Joseph Smith. In fact, Brian Hills was largely convinced this was the case until recently. Josephine Lyon was born in February 8th, 1844, which correlates with the con conception date of approximately May 18th, 1843 if she were full term. In 2016, Dr. Ugo Prago shared the results of his painstaking analysis of DNA data showing Windsor was Josephine's father. For many, this was not the expected result, but it makes it easier to understand Joseph's ceilings to legally married women. Uh, so this is a response from Jeremy Ronalds again from the CS letter. Uh, so this is a critical response. So here's what LDS apologist and Joseph Smith's polygamy author Brian C. Heels says. In 1915, Josephine the child related back in 1882, just months before mother's death. She told Josephine that in a very dramatic fashion that she had been sealed to the prophet at the time that Mr. H Mr. Lyon was out of fellowship with the church, that Josephine was actually Joseph Smith's daughter. Josephine married a guy named Fisher, and there's a whole Fisher family in Bountiful that descend from this. And I've been in contact with some of the descendants, and they are starting to say, maybe we need to make a claim that we're actually coming from Joseph and not from Windsor Lyon. For my research, there are only two children from the plural wives. This is one, Josephine. The other is Olive Frost's daughter or son. We don't even know the gender, as both Olive Frost and the child died before they left Nauvoo. And that's all. There are references to a third, but we don't know. Maybe some new evidence will come up and we will find out. So Brian Heels, uh, before the DNA evidence, believed that Josephine was the daughter of Joseph Smith, according to the evidence. Uh, Jeremy then says, looking at the timeline, that timeline we find that Windsor and Sylvia married in 1838 she conceives three children then he's excommunicated and that's when they separate it's not a legal divorce but she is then sealed to Joseph in a marriage that I argue would have superseded the legal marriage anyway which would curtail any conjugality between Sylvia and Windsor Josephine is conceived Joseph Smith is killed Windsor is rebaptized, and then they come back together and the legal marriage is still intact now, this is, uh, I think, very messy. I think Brian Heels, his original theory was that um, that Joseph uh, married Sylvia when her husband was out of fellowship with the church. And because he then married her when her husband was out of fellowship, that that supersedes their marriage because it was done under the priesthood. And then she was living and having sexual relations with Joseph and not her husband, even though they weren't officially divorced. But then after Joseph's death and when he got rebaptized, then she got back with Windsor. I don't think this would be his position probably now after the DNA evidence. But this is one that's really hard to make sense of and get your head around how that uh, seems right and makes sense. So here's, uh, we're going to move on. Did Joseph send men on missions in order to steal their wild wives while they were gone? So this is a common thing brought up uh, by critics and people who leave the church. Uh, so Brian Hill says, another detail in John Bennett's uh, affidavit is that the prophet had sent men on missions so he could marry their wives in Nauvoo. This statement is contradicted by historical data. Of the 12 polyandrous husbands, identified by Todd Compton, 10 were not on missions at the time Joseph was sealed to their legal wives. Of the two possible exceptions, only one Orson Hyde is documented as on a mission at the time of Miranda Johnson Hyde sealing to Joseph Smith. The second possible case involves George Harris, who left on his 14th month mission, in July 1840, his wife Lucinda may have been sealed to Joseph at some point, but the date is unavailable. So we're going to be looking at Orson Hyde, who I 
believe was one of the 12, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, the marriage and the sealing of Miranda Johnson to Joseph Smith. So in September 1831, Joseph and Emma Smith moved in with the Johnson family, while Joseph and Sidney Rigdon worked on translating the Bible. While staying with the Johnsons in March 1832, Joseph was dragged out by a mob and tarred and feathered. Miranda's brother, Eli, led the mob because he felt that Joseph had been too intimate with Miranda. Soon Miranda married Apostle Orson Hyde. On April 6th, 1840, Orson was sent on a three-year mission to Jerusalem. Joseph married his wife, Nancy Miranda Johnson Hyde, while Orson was gone. In Joseph's journal, in a list of his marriages, he wrote April uh, 42, Miranda Johnson to Joseph Smith. Later, Orson and Miranda separated. So this comes from a letter from my wife. Now, I think the um, the source for uh, the tarring and the feathering and it being because they felt that Joseph was being too in intimate with Nancy Miranda Hyde. I don't have the source, but I know that Brian Hales would say that it's a late source and that it's a second or, or third hand account and maybe isn't super reliable. Uh, but it, it implies that perhaps there was uh, an, an affection or uh, Joseph felt something towards Nancy Miranda. And then uh, around 10 years later, he then married her after sending his husband, her husband uh, on a mission and they later separated. So Hale says, if the 1842 date for the sealing between Joseph and Miranda, if their marriage is correct, then Joseph may have been sealed to Miranda in an eternity-only sealing without Orson Hyde's knowledge. Um, while such a sealing would not have affected her civil union with Orson, a late second-hand report from expose author Anne Eliza Webb Young states, when Joseph Smith first taught polygamy and gave the wives as well as the husbands opportunity to make new choice of life partners, Mrs. Hyde at that time a young and quite prepossessing woman became one of the prophet's numerous fancies. Hyde was away on a mission at the time, and when he returned, he in turn imbibed the teachings of polygamy also and prepared to extend his kingdom indefinitely. In the meantime, it was hinted to him that Smith had his first wife sealed to himself in his absence as a wife for eternity. Inconsistent as it may seem, Hyde was in a furious passion. However, John D. Lee remembered that Orson gave his permission, Hyde's wife, with his consent, and was sealed to Joseph for an eternal state. So this comes from Fair Lardy Saints. So I think it's a bit ambiguous how Orson felt about it. If he was angry about it, there's a statement that he gave consent, but it was done uh, most likely while he was away on his mission, um, which uh, I personally find bothersome I, I that troubles me i don't think that's right and i i don't um i don't know how to really reconcile that but that's uh that's really the history uh so this uh comes from lds discussions uh, and they point out that before uh he married uh nancy miranda hyde in december 1841 he gave a revelation to her uh, and i'm just going to read part of it read the whole quote so you can uh pause it but I'm going to read what it says in bold. Uh, so he's saying that, let my handmaid Nancy Miranda Hyde hearken to the counsel of my servant Joseph in all things whatsoever he shall teach unto her, and it shall be a blessing upon her and upon her children after her unto her justification, saith the Lord. And this is uh, the critic's sort of interpretation. It comes from LDS discussion. This revelation is interesting because Nancy's husband, Orson, had been sent on a mission to Jerusalem in April 1841. And December of that year, Joseph Smith gives Nancy a revelation to hearken to the counsel of my servant Joseph in all things whatsoever he shall teach unto her. And it shall be a blessing upon her and upon her children after her unto your justification, saith the Lord. Beyond Nancy's Hyde's role in the Nancy Rigdon proposal, she would also have become one of Joseph's polyandrous wives while her legal husband, Apostle Orson Hyde, was away on a mission. In other words, Nancy took this revelation seriously as she would not only agree to a, to a polyandrous marriage with Joseph Smith, but, be, but to become a will, willing recruiter to help Joseph Smith obtain more wives. So it seems that this revelation uh, might have gotten uh, Nancy to, you know, she's been told by the Lord in this revelation to, to hearken to the counsel of Joseph Smith and whatever he teaches her. And then whenever he proposed plural marriage, that then she was almost maybe, uh, you could say, groomed or conditioned to, uh, to accept it. 
Uh, so did Joe Smith have sex with these polyandrous wives? So this comes from a, a critical source, but it says Joseph not only paid his addresses to the young and un unmarried women, but he sought spiritual alliance with many married ladies. He taught them that all former marriages were null and void and that they were at perfect liberty to make another choice of husband. The marriage covenants were not binding because they were ratified only by Gentile laws. Consequently, all the women were free. So that's quite interesting. He's saying that um, they're sort of, they can be sealed to him and that there's liberty, that their marriage relationships aren't binding. Um, one woman said to me, not very long since, while giving some of her experiences in polygamy, the greatest trial I ever endured in my life was living with my husband and deceiving him by receiving Joseph's attentions whenever he chose to come to me. This woman and others whose experience has been very similar are among the very best women in the church. They are as pure-minded and virtuous women as any in the world. They were seduced under the guise of religion. Some of these women have since said they do not know who was the father of their children. This is not to be wondered at, for after Joseph's declaration, annulling all Gentile marriages, the greatest promiscuity was practiced, and indeed all sense of morality seemed to have been lost by a portion at least of the church. This quote is really... Um, you could say antagonistic, uh, you decide whether or not it's reliable and trustworthy, but if it's true, it's extremely troubling and extremely damning, uh, according to, to this, that some of the women claimed, now this is a third-hand account, that they were married to Joseph Smith and they were deceiving their husbands by having sexual relations with him at the same time. Uh, and that they weren't sure who was the father of their children, which you could point at and say, well, maybe Sylvia was one of those wives because she, that's why she said Joseph Smith was the mother of Josephine, uh, not her husband, Windsor. Uh, so this is what Faralardy Saints have to say. So this would be their sort of faithful response. They would say the available evidence does not support the claim that Joseph had intimate relations with these married women. Von Brody, who repeatedly stated her belief that Joseph had intimate relations with many of his plural wives, identified several individuals that she thought might be children of other, um, that she thought might be children of Joseph Smith. Even Brody noted that it is astonishing that evidence of other children than these has never come to light. Brody postulated, in spite of a complete lack of evidence, that Joseph Smith must have been able to successfully practice some sort of primitive birth control or that abortions must have been routine, routinely employed. To date, DNA analysis has ruled out Joseph Smith as the father of any of the children to the women to whom he was sealed, who are married to other men. Uh, so Farrell already seems to be saying that there's no uh, evidence to verify that Joseph Smith was having sexual relations with his polyandrous wives. There's no uh, DNA that's confirmed any children, although we, we, we can't know for, for sure if he was or if he wasn't. There's speculation by critics that perhaps he was having sexual relations and then there was uh, secret uh, abortions being done. That's, I suppose that's possible because uh, you know polygamy was illegal and uh, they wouldn't want, uh, although the purpose is to raise a righteous seed, if it was being practiced in secret, then they wouldn't want all these children uh, popping up, especially those who uh, belong to their legal husbands. Uh, but at the same time, jo we know Joseph Smith was was fertile. He had children with with uh, his wife Emma, and really, there's not strong enough evidence that Navy abortions was was happening. A lot of it's speculation. Violet Kimball says that shortly after Hebrews returned from England, he was introduced to the doctrine of plural marriage directly through a startling test. He had already sacrificed homes, possessions, friends, relatives, all worldly rewards, peace and tranquility for the restoration. Nothing was left to place on the altar save his life, his children and his wife. Then came the Abrahamic test. Joseph demanded for himself what to Heber was the unthinkable, his Violet. Totally crushed spiritually and emotionally, Heber touched neither food nor water for three days and three nights and continually sought confirmation and comfort from God. On the evening of the third day, some kind of assurance came and Heber took Violet to the upper room of Joseph's store on Water Street. The prophet wept and said, at this act of faith, devotion, and obedience, Joseph never intended to take Violet. It was all a test. Um, uh, 
so th this is uh, uh, sort of a tr troubling um, account that Heber C. Kimball, who, who was an apostle, that Joe Smith said that, um, you know, I, I want to marry your wife and that this really affected Heber. He could neither touch food nor water uh, and he was seeking comfort. He was seeking confirmation from God. He got some sort of an assurance. Uh, and then the prophet says, oh, it was all a test anyway, which kind of begs the question, why would he get that spiritual assurance if it was just uh, a test? Uh, but this comes from the CS letter. If Joseph's po polygamous or polyandrous marriages are dynastic ceilings, so just for the afterlife, as the church and apologists are now theorizing, and Joseph wanted to dynastically link himself to the Kimball family, why was Apostle Heber C. Kimball so troubled by Joseph's command for his wife that he touched neither food nor water for three days and three nights? So, so I think he's implying that Heber wouldn't have this reaction uh, if it didn't mean uh, sexual relations as part of the marriage it wasn't just sailing although we can't know that for sure he might have been just as bothered had joseph have asked to be sealed to his wife for eternity um but i definitely don't like uh the fact that he is doing this sort of abrahamic test and sort of testing his faith um i, d I don't uh, agree with that and i don't think it's right so this uh is a long quote uh but this is a really important quote. So why it may have been that some men were willing to allow Joseph to marry their wife is because they had the same attitude as Ded Jedediah M. Grant. He was second counselor to Brigham Young. In this similar sermon delivered on the 19th of February, 1854, Grant says this. So this is very long. Uh, so bear with me as I go through it. When the family organization was revealed from heaven, the patriarchal order of God, Joseph began on the right and on the left. To add to his family, what a quaking there was in Israel, says one brother to another. Joseph says all covenants are done away and none are binding but the new covenants. Now that that goes hand in hand with the quote uh, we read that was kind of antagonistic, but it's saying here that all old covenants are done away and it's the new covenants that are binding. I suppose Joseph uh, should come and say he wanted your wife. What would you say to that? I would tell him to go to hell. This was the spirit of many in the early days of this church. If the Lord Almighty has organized a government upon the earth and has committed the keys and priesthood of it to his prophet, that prophet holds jurisdiction over the earth. So he's saying that Joseph Smith has power and jurisdiction over the whole earth, the same as Adam did in the beginning. And righteous men in every dispensation since the creation, if they had any keys, had the keys of the kingdom of God. I'm going to skip a bit. If Joseph had right to dictate me in relation to salvation and in relation to a hereafter, he had a right to dictate me in relation to all my earthly affairs, in relation to the treasures of the earth and in relation to the earth itself. He had a right to dictate in relation to the cities of the earth to the natives of the earth and in relation to everything on land and on sea. This is what he had a right to do if he had any right at all. Uh, so I'm going to move on. The priesthood has been given to Joseph Smith and has been handed down to his successors. What would a man say who felt all right when Joseph asked him for his money? He would say, yes, and I wish I had more to help build up the kingdom of God. Or if he came and said, I want your wife. Oh yes, he would say, here she is. There are plenty more. Did the prophet want every man's wife he asked for? He did not. But in that thing was the grand thread of the priesthood developed. The grand object in view was to try the people of God to see what was in them. If such a man of God should come to me and say, I want your gold and silver or your wives, I should say, here they are. I wish I had more to give you. Take all I have got. A man who has got the spirit of God and the light of eternity in him has no trouble about such matters. So that quote is uh, really, I think, um, submitting and obeying authority to its to its max. That if the prophet would ask you, you know, for your house, you know, uh, dictating, you know, your work, asking for your money, or even for your wife, uh, that you that you would give it to them because they have jurisdiction and power over uh, the whole earth and. Um, perhaps that's how many of the early members of the church who Joseph Smith married their wives and Brigham Young after that was their their mindset. You know, they're the prophet. They they have uh, the authority, 
and they have the, the keys and uh, I just have to submit to to God's will. Uh, and I, I find that very troubling and problematic. Uh, I definitely think that's going down FLDS and Warren Jeff's territory of if, if you've watched that show on Netflix, uh, uh, was it Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey? that he really felt that he had the right to dictate in all affairs of people's lives and to take their wives and the, their children from them and decide who married who. Uh, and that's just, that's a lot of power. And that if that's what was happening, uh, definitely very troubling. So going back uh, to jerusalemspolygamy.org, among the Latter-day Saints, the practice would have been equally controversial. The revelation on celestial and plural marriage now, in section 132 in the Doctrine and Covenants, contains three references to sexually polyandrous relations. All three labeled them as adultery, with two cases stating the woman involved would be destroyed. So yes, if a woman uh, who was who had a legal husband then had uh, was sealed and had sexual relations with Joseph Smith, that would be adultery, and the woman in that case would be destroyed, according to DNC 132. During his lifetime, even Joseph Smith's enemy failed to exploit the charge. After excommunication, John C. Bennett identifies several of Joseph's plural wives in his 1842 publication, History of the Saints, calling them spiritual wives. Yet Bennett never accused Joseph of polyandry, nor did he invite the husbands of the women he listed to join with him in persecuting Joseph, even though he had appealed to many others to do so. Similarly, William Law, who was a polygamy insider in Nauvoo, who apostatized and went to Carthage on May 23rd, 1844, to charge Joseph with adultery with one of his previously unmarried plural wives, Maria Lawrence. Law undoubtedly knew of Joseph's dealings to legally married women, but he ignored the chance to accuse him of practicing polyandry. So that's uh, interesting uh, evidence being presented that neither John C. Bennett or William Law, who uh, apostatized and who... Uh, made accusations and about Joseph Smith's polygamy, they didn't uh, condemn him or call him out for practicing sexual polyandry, uh, which may be evidence that it wasn't happening. So the church, uh, this is from their gospel topics essay. So how do they try to make sense of this? So there are several possible explanations for this practice being polyandry. These ceilings may have provided a way to create an eternal bond or link between Joseph's family and other families within the church. These ties extended both vertically from parent to child and horizontally from one family to another. Today, such eternal bonds are achieved through the temple marriages of individuals who are sealed to their own birth families. In this way, linking families together, Joseph's ceilings to women already married may have been an early version of linking one family to another. So like these dynastic ceilings having one big eternal family. In Nauvoo, most of it, most if not all of the first husbands seem to have continued living in the same household with their wives during Joseph's lifetime. And complaints about these ceilings with Joseph Smith are virtually absent from the documentary record. Now, a critic might push back. And as we look at those other quotes, uh, particularly one from the counselor to Brigham Young, uh, who stated about, you know, submitting and obeying uh, that prophetic authority. That might be why there is no complaints. But even those who weren't members of the church um, didn't complain against Joseph Smith. These ceilings may also be explained by Joseph's reluctance to enter plural marriage because of the sorrow it would bring to his wife, Emma. He may have believed that ceilings to married women would comply with the Lord's command without requiring him to have a normal marriage relationship. This could explain why, according to Lorenzo Snow, the angel reprimanded Joseph for having demurred on plural marriage, even after he had entered into the practice. After this rebuke, according to this interpretation, Joseph re returned primarily to ceilings with single women. Uh, another possibility is that in an era when lifespans were shorter than they are today, faithful women felt an urgency to be sealed by priesthood authority. Several of these women were married either to non-Mormons or former Mormons, and more than one of the women later expressed unhappiness in their present marriages. Living in a time when divorce was difficult to obtain, these women may have believed a ceiling to Joseph Smith would give them the blessings they might not otherwise receive in the next life. So those are some possible interpretations or explanations uh, for why uh, Joseph Smith was being sealed and married to other men's wives. Maybe it was dynastic sealings. Maybe Joseph Smith was doing it when he was commanded to practice polygamy as a way to not uh, bring sorrow to Emma, that he thought he could fulfill it by just marrying other men's wives. 
but then uh, he then was sort of reprimanded and then he began marrying single women or it was uh, because these women uh, wanted to be sealed to a husband in the next life and uh, they wanted that um, and they went to Joseph Smith. So yes, Ladder would say that church and apologists now attempt to justify these polyandrous marriages by theorizing that they probably didn't include sexual relations or our dynastic ceilings alone. How is having sex with a living man's wife on earth only to take her away? Or how is not having sex with a living man's wife on earth only to take her away from the eternities to be one of your 40 wives any better or any less immoral? Um, I get that that question. I think for the women who whose husbands weren't members of the church, I can understand those ceilings to Joseph. Uh, for the ones who were members of the church, I honestly don't understand why they couldn't have been sealed to their own husband. I know Brian Hills would say, you know, women would have their choice and they could choose. Uh, and perhaps it was that their old covenant was done away and, and this one superseded it. Uh, but that one really bothers me. You know, if, if you know, my, my wife, if, uh, the bishop or, or, you know, one of the leaders of the church, uh, sealed themselves to my wife for eternity. I, I would have a problem with that. I, I can't make sense of that. So in summary, uh, so Joseph Smith married 14 women who had legal husbands. The majority of these women continue to live with their husbands after the sealings. There is no to little evidence of sexual relations occurring uh, which would violate DNC 132 and be adultery, although there is some evidence uh, that that might have been the case. Uh, did Sylvia have sex with both Joseph and Windsor at the same time, which is why she believed her daughter was Joseph's, not Windsor? It's possible, although DNA proves it's Windsor's daughter. Orson Hyde was sent away on a mission and Joseph Smith married his wife, Mirinda, while he was away. Uh, it's quite troubling that the prophet could ask four other men's wives looking at the Hebrew C. Kimball account uh, and whether it was for time or for eternity. This does, when you think about it, it seems to be in, con in conflict with one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. It's really hard to reconcile, don't covet your neighbor's wife, whether for time and eternity or for eternity. And Joseph Smith's practice of polyandry, it's hard to make sense of that. Although the primary purpose for polygamy was to have children, it is not known whether these marriages were consummated or if they were just eternal ceilings, as the church likes to believe. I think the evidence is quite ambiguous and there's really, you can interpret different ways. There are some accounts, some evidence that would support that these were just ceilings. And you could look at some of the evidence and say, no, I think he was practicing sexual polyandry, which would be in violation of DNC 132 and would be adultery and would definitely call in to question, uh, is it a righteous principle, uh, the practice of polygamy? So that was definitely a long one. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, please uh, find out more about yourself on these matters. JosephSmithPolygamy.org is a great resource. Look at the LES Gospel Topics essay. Brian Heels is a great scholar on the matter. Uh, Lindsay Hanson Park as well had some great videos. In the next video, we're going to be looking at his marriages to teenage girls. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of them, such as Helen Mark Kimball, Lucy Walker, the Partridge Sisters. Uh, so it's going to be a really good episode. If you've enjoyed this episode, give it a thumbs up. Uh, please like, share and subscribe to my channel. Uh, you can follow me on my Facebook page, Mormonism with the Murph. And if you want to support me, you can donate to my PayPal, stephen.murphy1996 at outlook.com. And I will see you all on the next episode. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.